John, bullying of critics at home and abroad, and suppression of freedom of religion, freedom of speech, civil society, and rule of law across the country. This commission, which exists to shine a light on the real human rights situation in China, has sought to prevent these Olympic Games from perverting the Olympic spirit and distracting from the real story. We have held multiple hearings, including one with the top US-based Olympic sponsors. We've engaged those sponsors, the International Olympic Committee, the US Olympic and Paralympic Committee, broadcasters, United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights. I hope it has made a difference in the degree to which US companies are willing to lend their prestige to the false display of peace and harmony the Beijing Olympics represent. I hope it will influence the way these games are covered and the way these games are perceived by the world. I hope it will provide support to the Olympians who fear for their freedom of expression, their data privacy, and their basic rights. But these Olympics are commencing and will show a face the Chinese government and Communist Party don't deserve to show to the world. In this hearing, we will put a spotlight on the face of repression, the exact face and stories the organizers of the Beijing Olympics don't want the world thinking about as the torch is lit. For the last 60 days, the Congressional Executive Commission on China has conducted a daily Olympic prisoner social media campaign to tell a few of these stories. There are so many more in the CECC political prisoner database which is only a sliver of the untold number of Chinese citizens detained or disappeared merely for exercising their human rights or being a member of a disfavored minority group. To better document these cases, in recent months we've revamped the database in several ways. In June 2021, we launched a new platform aimed at modernizing the database to address the security and sustainability concerns, streamline information, and maintain our ability to record and display a wide variety of data. This upgrade enhanced the database of search functionality, added publication of prior detentions, expanded detention details, and created a permanent archived source link. The CECC political prisoner database recently began to document cases of political detention and imprisonment in Hong Kong in recognition of the rapid deterioration in the rule of law conditions, including arrests made under the national security law, as well as ongoing loss of independence of the judiciary and prosecutor's office. I never thought I would see the day when that would be necessary, but the sad reality is here, and it's our mandate to document these cases. In this hearing, we will hear about some of these cases in Hong Kong, as well as others we've highlighted in the Olympic Prisoner Project. We are deeply Honored that one of the greatest champions of human rights in China, Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, is here to help frame our discussion of these cases. I am similarly humbled by the panel of witnesses we'll hear from who will tell deeply personal accounts of the repression they and their family members have suffered. These witnesses have started organizations dedicated to the causes of human rights, rule of law, and democracy. They have lost fathers husbands, uncles, friends, to the Chinese system of arbitrary detention, and they have been locked up themselves. I can think of nobody better to hear from on the eve of the Beijing Olympics. These and the images behind them are the faces of repression we hope the world remembers at the Olympics get underway. Congressman Govern. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for convening this hearing. Uh, on prisoners of conscience on the eve of the Beijing Winter Olympics. Thank you for your leadership on so many human rights issues. I'm also honored to be here with my colleague from Virginia, uh, Jennifer Wexton, uh, who's been a leader on so many uh, issues related to human rights. And obviously, I'm thrilled to be here with, uh, and honored to be here with the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi. Uh, before I begin, um, I want to just say a few words about uh, the Asian American community. Uh, they have experienced a spike in hate crimes, discrimination, and invectives directed toward them. This has happened in a climate where public figures have declared or implied 
that China is to blame for all our ills. Think China virus. This commission monitors the human rights record of the Chinese government. Our criticism is not directed at the people of China or of Chinese heritage. I, t I take great care, and I know the co-chair, uh, the chair does as well, uh, to make this distinction clear. And I hope that all my fellow commissioners do as well. This commission's important work is based on international human rights standards. Our message is strongest when grounded in the law and morals. We must strive to keep it that way. Hundreds of athletes are preparing to compete in this Olympics. They have trained for years. This may be their last or only shot at a medal. Ideally, the athlete's experience should be uncomplicated by the venue or the host. But sadly, that is not the case in 2022. When the International Olympics Committee awarded these games to Beijing in 2015, China already had the worst human rights record of any country on the planet. It has gotten worse since. The Chinese government has engaged in genocide against the Turkic Muslims, cracked down on civil society, and snuffed out democracy and freedom in Hong Kong. Many, including members of this bipartisan commission, asked the IOC to relocate the games so that the athletes wouldn't have to compete under a cloud of repression. They refused. We asked the IOC's U.S.-based corporate sponsors to use their leverage to insist on human rights improvements so athletes on the medal stand wouldn't have human rights violations as the backdrop. They refused. They, save one, wouldn't even admit to the fact that genocide is happening in Xinjiang. If given a choice, I believe no athlete would want to compete in a country committing genocide and crimes against humanity. But that is what they are forced to do because of the feckless IOC and its corporate sponsors. You know, the, ri ri the risks are real. Last month, a Chinese Olympic official said that, and I quote, any behavior or speech that is against the Olympic spirit, especially against the Chinese laws and regulations, are also subject to certain punishment, end quote. Reportedly, the app that athletes are required to use in Beijing could result in theft of their personal information. Participants could be exposed to food or clothing made by IOC exclusive suppliers who use forced labor. Make no mistake, I am rooting for the athletes. I hope nothing goes wrong. The athletes shouldn't be forced to bear this burden created by companies and entities who want to protect their ability to make money, no matter the human cost. I don't drink Coca-Cola anymore. They operate a bottling plant in Xinjiang. They source sugar from a company implicated in forced labor. Coke will be served at Olympic venues. Every athlete should be aware of the risk. Sponsor companies told us if they spoke up, they would lose market share in China. And then, they, and, and then they don't speak up. This is wrong. You know, uh, you know th this has to change. The paradigm must change. These companies are going to need to figure out a way to make money other than reliance on forced labor and abetting crimes against humanity. The IOC will eagerly inform us how many viewers around the world will watch the games. But they won't tell us who can't watch the games those unjustly imprisoned and deprived of their most basic freedoms by the host Chinese government. Ilham Toti, Ding Ji Ashi, Joshua Wong, Zhang Zhan, Bunko Ki. These are faces of repression and resilience who are represented by our witnesses today. We must always remember the human dimension behind our policy work. It is for prisoners of conscience that we speak out. We must never, never, ever forget them. One person who has never forgotten this is our first witness, Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi. She has been a principled voice for human rights in China and Tibet for decades. And I want to thank her in particular for working with all of us in a bipartisan way to get the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act uh, through the Congress and on the President's desk where he signed it. She has been a champion for so much important legislation. We welcome her, and we welcome all of our witnesses, and I look forward to your testimonies.
Thank you, Congressman McGovern. Speaker Nancy Pelosi is the 52nd Speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives. She made history in 2007 when she was the first woman elected to serve as Speaker of the House, and again in January 2019 when she regained her position second in line to the presidency. Few alive have been as stalwart as Nancy Pelosi in fighting for the rights of the Chinese people, and we are deeply honored to have you with us this morning. Welcome. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for your invitation to be here, for your kind introduction, for your great leadership. Your opening statement was values-based, a source of inspiration, and you use the word hope. It gives us hope as to how we go forward and how we can shed light on the injustices that are happening in China. I'm honored to be with you and with Mr. McGovern, uh, who has been, we call him our spiritual leader on this subject when we've been to China and Tibet and the rest uh, because, again, he has been relentless over the years and uh, intensely involved in shining a light on human rights violations in China, particularly now with the genocide of the Uyghurs. Uh, Congresswoman Wexton is blessed with a large number of Uyghurs in her district, and so she has been an important leader in passing the legislation that Mr. McGovern <coughs> and you referenced. I thank you for your leadership, Congresswoman Wexton. I know it will probably be coming. Chris Smith has been, we've worked in a bipartisan way for decades on this subject, sometimes with another Virginian, Frank Wolf, no longer in the Congress, but always with us uh, in this struggle. So as House Speaker, it is my privilege to again to again testify before the CECC, as I did most recently on May 2021, and to do so with leaders with whom I have worked to fight for human rights in China. As I mentioned, Mr. Chairman, Senator Merkley, you have been a respected voice on the Foreign, Relation, Foreign Affairs, Foreign Relations, I guess it is in the Senate, Foreign Relations Committee, and a CECC chair bring a steadfast commitment to ensuring our nation lives up to our values abroad. Mr. McGovern, CECC co-chair, has been a clarion voice on human rights in, in the House, across the country, and around the world, and a leader since his days in the Congress, well, actually as a sp staffer before, but in Congress to advance human rights in China. I thank also Chris Smith, again, a former co-chair of this commission, longtime partner to many of us, to hold Beijing accountable and again, thank Congresswoman Wexton for her leadership. Thank you, uh, Mr. Wexley, for Mr. Merkley, on the entire Congressional Executive Commission on China for hosting this important and timely hearing, Beijing Olympics and the Faces of Repression. When the Olympic Winter Committees begin tomorrow in Beijing, the Chinese government once again attempt to distract the world from a decades-long campaign of abuse and repression. But the United States and the international community know the truth. The People's Republic of China is perpetrating a campaign of gross human rights violations, including genocide. Over the next two weeks, it is our urgent moral duty to shine a bright light on the many human rights violations being perpetrated by the host nation. And I say by the host nation because I associate myself with the remarks of Mr. McGovern, this is not about Chinese people. It's about the People's Republic of China and the repressive government that has been in power. While we fully support and will root for our athletes, we cannot and will not be silent on human rights in China. And I also am honored to be here with brave witnesses testifying today. Yao Xu A and Chao, uh, Johar Ilham, Sophie Luau, uh, Nima Lamo, and Nathan Law. Nathan remotely is my understanding. For decades, the PRC has orchestrated a campaign of terror and repression, from the genocide of the Uyghur people most recently to aggression against culture, religion, and language of Tibet to crackdowns against the basic freedoms 
in Hong Kong, to jailing of journalists, activists, and dissidents throughout mainland China, and intimidation of Taiwan, and more. Yet the Chinese government works desperately to cover up their abuses, rewriting history and projecting a very different image to the world, or tries to anyway. Many in Congress have fought to ensure that the world remembers the truth of the PRC's human rights record and to hold them accountable, including by seeking to deny them the honor of hosting the Olympics. In 1993, Congress passed strongly bipartisan legislation calling on the IOC to reject China's 2000 bid, and we were successful then in doing so. Many of us again opposed China's 2008 bid. Sadly, the IOC chose to sell out on human rights in China, but we cannot, we continue to speak out, including by urging President President, urging President Bush then to boycott the opening ceremonies. Now the IOC, aided by corporate sponsors, once again turns a blind eye with the 2022 Winter Olympics just to bolster their bottom lines, Mr. McGovern mentioned. As I was said, if we do not speak out against human rights violations in China because of commercial interest, we lose all moral authority to speak out against human rights violations anywhere. And that is why at a CECC hearing last May, I called for no official presence at the Beijing Olympics. Thanks to strong leadership of President Biden, the administration has joined Congress in presenting a united front in this effort. And proudly, many nations have followed America's lead, including the United Kingdom, Canada, Australia, Belgium, Denmark, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania. Make no mistake, our athletes should participate. They've trained, they're disciplined, they've dreamed, they've aspired, they've worked hard. But this year, we must celebrate them from home as they compete in China. I would say to our athletes, you're there to compete. Do not risk incurring the anger of the Chinese government because they are ruthless. I know there is a temptation on the part of some to speak out while they are there. I respect that, but I also worry about what the Chinese government might do to their reputations, to their families. So again, participate. Let us celebrate from abroad and don't risk thinking that there are any good intentions on the part of the Chinese, the People's Republic of China government, because there are none. While you're competing, Congress continues to take bold bipartisan action to defend human rights in China and hold the Chinese government accountable. Most recently, the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act, which was proudly signed into law in December, will harness America's economic might to make clear the genocide of Uyghurs must end now. And now, with our America Competes Act, which is on the floor of the House, we will take another strong step to help those who fear uh, for their futures by designating Uyghurs as prioritized refugees of special humanitarian concern and pursuing a humanitarian pathway for Hong Kongers who feel political persecution. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, and Congresswoman, one of the most sinister forms of torture employed by authoritarian regimes, and certainly the PRC, is to tell the prisoners, nobody even remembers you. They don't know why you're in prison. Uh, so why are you just insisting on the truth? We say that. With this hearing, we declare to all that who are suffering in the PRC under their abuses, America sees you. America stands with you. America will continue to fight for you. That is why I'm so proud to join our witnesses today to lift up the names for those who were in prison, such as democracy activist Jimmy Lau, Jimmy Lei and Joshua Wong, Uyghur leader Ilham Toti, and the Panchen Lama, uh, just to name a few. Now, we have, as Chair, Chairman Merkley indicated, we have reams of names of prisoners 
who will not be forgotten. Many of them will be named by our witnesses today. In that spirit of remembering and saying to the PRC, no matter what you do, we, are, we will not forget, we will not go away. Much of our activism when this started in Tiananmen Square, when we saw you crush, crush the young lives and hopes and dreams of so many young people in China who were there to demonstrate for a better future. Crush them with your tanks and then try to erase from the history and the memory of people in China what happened that day. But we will persist. In that spirit, I'll close by quoting Li Chongqian, a former legislator who has devoted his life to keeping alive the memories of those who died fighting for freedom in Tiananmen Square. A former chairman of the now defunct Hong Kong Alliance in support of patriotic democratic movements of China, he is currently serving time in prison simply for standing up for democracy. He said the following to the judge, before he was sentenced this past fall. And I quote, for 32 years, we have marched together in the fight to bring justice to those who put their lives on the line June 4th, 1989, and in the struggle for democracy. Despite setbacks, we are steadfast in our belief that the universal values of freedom, the rule of law, human rights, and democracy that we have been struggling for will one day take root in Hong Kong and China. And on that day, we will be able to console the souls who came before us. Thank you to the CECC for the opportunity to participate today and to elevate the voices of the Chinese government that the government that the Chinese and to elevate the voices that the Chinese government has worked relentlessly to silence. We will not be silenced. We will not let those with courage be forgotten. With that, I thank you again for the work of this committee, not just this hearing today, but on the ongoing, and especially at this time, in this time, one day before the Olympics begin. It's hard to fathom how they could choose a country like China to host the Olympics, but they have, and we wish all of the athletes well. We wish them safety, and that safety includes don't for one moment believe anything the Chinese government might tell you about freedom of expression. You take a risk. Be safe. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Madam. Thank you, Madam Speaker, for your powerful words and your powerful advocacy for human rights in China and around the world. Thank you. I'll now introduce our panel of witnesses. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, yes. Ranking Member Chris yes. Smith. Hello there. Hello. Good morning. Would you like to make a comment? If I could, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, you know, as the chairman of this commission for four years, co-chairman for another four years, and ranking member for eight uh, as well, 16 years total, uh, this has always been a very bipartisan commission seeking to protect uh, democracy activists and, and, and others. And certainly today's hearing uh, is, and I thank you, Chairman Mark. Mer Berkeley for, for bringing this about, particularly today, the day before the Genocide Olympics uh, kick off. Uh, the first hearing that we had, because this is part of a series, in the Lantos Commission, and I chaired that one along with Co-Chair McGovern on the Lantos Commission. That was on May 18th, entitled China, Genocide in the Olympics. And we were then as well joined by Speaker Pelosi, and thank you for that. Uh, I do thank you that she reminded us back in 1983, Congress took a very strong action in admonishing the IOC uh, not to accept China for the Olympics in the year 2000. I actually uh, met with Wei Jing Shang, the father of the Democracy Wall Movement, uh, who was let out of prison. I met with him in Beijing uh, as a high value political prisoner uh, to get the Olympics 2000. When they didn't get it, they rearrested him and beat, it, beat him almost to the point of death. Uh, so the Chinese. Communist Party uh, methods have not changed. They have actually gotten worse than Xi Jinping, as we all know. In 2018, Chairman Marco Rubio and I uh, wrote a letter to the IOC, and I know others have done it too, and that was mentioned earlier, uh, to say, don't go to China. Uh, uh, we love the Chinese people, and we stand with the oppressed and not with the oppressor, and that's the Chinese Communist Party. So thank you, Speaker, for reminding us of the 83 efforts 
Uh, unfortunately, we did not succeed this time. The second hearing that you had, and I want to thank you for that, uh, was the corporate sponsorship of the genocide games. Uh, it examined the complicity of companies such as Coca-Cola, Visa, and Airbnb uh, in subsidizing Xi Jinping's propaganda extravaganza. Uh, the genocide against the Uyghurs, and we all know this, this is Xi Jinping's genocide. He should be at the Hague being held to account for crimes against humanity and genocide, and instead he'll be at those opening ceremonies and throughout, uh, shining in the spotlight while people are being uh, forced into labor, are being tortured, and are being killed, including forced abortions in order to d diminish the population of the Uyghurs. You know, on the eve of the Genocide Olympics, uh, today's hearing will elevate the voices of those who speak for the oppressed, including Yashwe Azal, who reminds us of the ordeal suffered by tennis star uh, Peng uh, Shewei, sexually preyed upon by a 75-year-old member of the Chinese Communist Party Politburo Standing Committee. In so telling her story, we will also hear about the courageous stand taken by the Women's Tennis Association in suspending all tournaments in China, in stark contrast to the craven pandering by the International Olympic Committee and its corporate sponsors, again, to Xi Jinping's brutality and cruelty. We will hear witnesses from representatives from other repressed communities, including Tibetan Uyghurs and Uyghurs, and from the great Hong Kong defender of democracy, Nathan Law. You know, indeed, just last week on January 27, I stood, out, stood outside the Chinese embassy in protest with a crowd of remarkable activists, including Chen Guanzhen, calling for democracy, rule of law, and an end to the human rights abuse. The next day in New York, Tom Swazi was outside of the United Nations protesting the Chinese Communist Party. As I noted then, with the crowd of activists before me, we were there for about three hours, it was a three hour gathering. Uh, and I will note it today, with our great witnesses gathered before us, you are representing the people and speaking for those in China who are voiceless. And just uh, as we spoke at the embassy last week, uh, those cries need to be heard and the international committee, and matter of fact, those, those uh, participants in this Olympics they need to be protected. If they speak out in China, what will happen to them? And we will be watching that very closely as well. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you very much, Mr. Congressman, and for your longtime advocacy for human rights. I'd now like to introduce our panel of witnesses, some of whom are joining us here in person and some joining us virtually from other parts of the world. Yashe Sao is the founder and editor of China Change, a website launched in 2013 to write and translate information about Chinese citizens' struggle for human rights, the rule of law, and civil society. Cao grew up in northern China during the Cultural Revolution. Now she works with dissidents, human rights lawyers, activists, and intellectuals to bring often suppressed information to a global audience. Nathan Law is a democracy activist currently in exile in London the youngest legislative counselor in Hong Kong's history. His seat was overturned in July 2017 following the Chinese government's constitutional reinterpretation. He was later jailed for his participation in the Umbrella Movement. In 2018, the CECC nominated him and his fellow student activists Joshua Wong and Alex Chow for the Nobel Peace Prize. In 2020, he was listed as one of the most 100 most influential people in the world by time. Joer Ilham is an advocate for the Uyghur community and her imprisoned father, Ilham Toti. He works at the Worker Rights Consortium. She works at the Workers' Rights Consortium and is also a spokesperson for the Coalition to End Uyghur Forced Labor. She has received numerous awards worldwide on behalf of her father, including the European Parliament's Sakharov Award. Her second book, Because I Have To, The Path to Survival, The Uyghur Struggle, will be released this spring. Sophie Luo is the wife of human rights defender Ding Jiaxi. Her husband was detained in April 2013 and sentenced to three years and six months in prison after calling for government transparency. He was forcibly disappeared on December 26, 2019. Ms. Lau continues to advocate for the release of her husband. Nima Lamo 
is a human rights advocate and niece of the late Tolku Tenzin Delik Rinpoche, a highly revered Tibetan Lama who died in a Chinese prison in 2015. After questioning the cause of his death, Ms. Lama was arbitrarily detained along with her mother. She continues to call for an investigation into the treatment of her uncle and other Tibetans. Our witnesses, thank you for being here. And we will now begin with our first witness, uh, Ms. Sao. Chair Merkley, Co-Chair McGovern, members of the Commission, thank you for holding this important hearing and for asking me to share my thought on the case of the Chinese tennis star Peng Shui. Indeed, Peng Shui has become a special kind of a political prisoner. Peng Shui revealed how she was forced into a sexual relationship with Zhang Gaoli, former vice premier and a member of the CCP Politburo Standing Committee. Despite repeated reassurance from the Chinese government and the International Olympic Committee, questions about her well-being remain. Meanwhile, the Women's Tennis Association's decision to suspend all tournaments in China has raised the moral question for all of us. I will address these two aspects of the Peng Shui incident. China's treatment of Peng Shui followed a familiar playbook namely censorship, denial of the sexual assault allegations, a concerted propaganda campaign, and a staged TV confession. Both Peng Shui's Weibo post and her account were deleted. A WTA-affiliated WeChat account posts only news and photos of tennis events. Chinese netizens are censored for mentioning Peng Shui or the WTA, in short, the Chinese government has erased any discussion about Peng Shui inside China. Outside China, Chinese overseas state media and the IOC have carried out a propaganda campaign. In the email purportedly from Peng Shui to WTA, Peng Shui denied sexual assault allegations and asked the WTA cease to talk about her without her consent. After WTA announced the suspension of tournaments in China, the IOC issued a troubling statement parroting CCP's official language on, quote, human rights, end quote, urging quiet diplomacy to address concerns over Peng Shui. Such unlikely unison raises suspicions that the IOC was coordinating with the CCP to suppress the matter. In mid-December, a pro-Beijing newspaper in Singapore posted a video interview with Peng Shui in which she stated that she had never accused anyone of sexually assaulting her and that she had no reason to travel overseas. An important takeaway from this interview is that the Chinese government doesn't really care whether you recognize the interview as staged or not. By getting Peng Shui to say what she is scripted to say, China established the new ground for going forward. Now that Peng Shui herself has spoken, what else do you want? So what comes next? Since Chinese uh, player Li Na won the French Open in 2011, interest in women's tennis skyrocketed in China. By 2019, before the pandemic, the WTA was holding over 20 events a year in China. In 2018, the WTA signed a 10-year contract with China to hold its season finals in Shenzhen. China needs the WTA to develop a women's uh, tennis, and the WTA was poised to expand into the Chinese market and profit big. So far, WTA is not backing down from its demands for variable proof of uh, Peng Shui's safety and the investigation into her allegation of sexual assault. WTA also confirmed that they have not been able to speak to Peng Shui, quote, in the environment where, where we know she's not being really controlled, end quote. After the Winter Olympics, we will see more CCP maneuvers try to bring the WTA to its knees. 
China has gotten used to foreign businesses bowing to its demands. The WTA's position is an unacceptable offense. Now, nobody is against the money, but our businesses, universities, and sports leagues don't seem to fully grasp that to eat at the CCP's picture, you will have to turn into a pig, shed away your principles. It's long past due that we have a hard look at the way we strike deals with the CCP China. And if we don't, we stand to lose ourselves in the process. It's already happening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We now turn to our second witness, Nathan Law. Chair Merkley, Co-Chair McGovern, and members of the Commission. It's really nice to hear Speaker Pelosi again, and thank you for her tireless support to our movements. I'm very grateful for the invitation to this important hearing. On August 17th, 2017, I was sitting in the dock of the Court of Appeal in Hong Kong with Joshua Wong and Alex Chow. We were all sentenced to months of imprisonment for inciting and participating in an unlawful yet peaceful assembly during the Umbrella Movement. Today, while I'm in exile in the UK, Joshua has been sitting in jail for a year without knowing when his trial under the national security law can even begin. The number of high profile political prisoners has continued to rise as the government crackdowns on professors, reporters, and many other members of civil society. Americans used to talk about Hong Kong as the pearl of the Orient and one of Asia's freest enclaves. Now, however, all there is to associate with the city is rising authoritarianism and the decline of freedoms. Since the massive 2019 protesters, tens of thousands of protesters have been arrested with more than 2,000 formally charged. And all of this has occurred in parallel to government appointed judges presiding over national security law cases. Joshua was very young when I met him, and we have been fighting alongside each other for eight years. He was my closest ally, and we shared joys and pains. So it is particularly hard that amid the Lunar New Year, traditionally when families and friends gather and celebrate, that he and a lot of my friends are still behind bars while I'm unable to connect with my family because it will endanger them. The political turmoil in Hong Kong and the growing number of political prisoners show that Chinese leaders have grown very confident about their more technologically advanced and sophisticated Orwellian model of social control. They disregard any commitment to human rights and international obligations. Last December, to counter President Joe Biden's Summit for Democracy, at which I was privileged to speak as the sole Hong Kong representative, they published a white paper promoting what they call China democracy. They claimed that China's democracy was the one that worked. They tried to redefine democracy in a way that universal suffrage, checks and balances, and the division of power would not be part of it. Instead, they called the totalitarian system in China, in which the people have absolutely no rights to elect their country's leaders as a democracy. This is the level of disinformation and hostility they are imposing on the free world. They are trying to undermine the history of Hong Kong, the culture of Hong Kong, what it means to be a Hong Konger, and most importantly, the democratic values that we all treasure. The Chinese government has broken every promise it made to the world ahead of the last Olympic Games it held in the summer of, 20, uh, of 2008. 14 years later, under General Secretary Xi Jinping, it is more aggressive and arrogant than ever. To see corporations and other countries rolling the red carpet for it is plainly disgusting. There's nothing to celebrate about the current Winter Olympics 
in Beijing while a genocide is literally happening. That is why an even larger coalition of activists, not just Hong Kongers, but also our Uyghur, Tibetan, Taiwanese allies are standing up now. The Biden administration is right to diplomatically boycott the event. But there are far more policymakers in Washington can do. To support Hong Kong, Congress should consider the various bills on every, everything from sanctions to internet freedom that have been introduced in recent years. Of even more importance are humanitarian pathways for Hong Kongers in need, including the Hong Kong Safe Harbor Act, the Hong Kong People's Freedom and Choice Act, and the relevant portions of the American Competes Act, which I know the leadership and many members of this commission support. The Olympic Games may be a one-off event, but our struggle against China is global, essential, and potentially lifelong. We will all do well to reduce our reliance on China in every way possible and forge better multilateral partnerships with like-minded stakeholders to coordinate an international pushback. We must grasp every opportunity to send a signal and stop the complacency. Fight for freedom, stand with Hong Kong. Thank you so much, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Law. Now, Ms. Ilham. Thank you, uh, Senator Merkley and Congressman McGovern for hosting this hearing and inviting me here to testify. And I'd like to thank uh, Madam Speaker Pelosi for being here and for your tireless, tireless work to pass the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act. In April 2014, I testified before this committee on behalf of my father, Ilham Tohti, an economics professor at Beijing Minzu University who had been detained that year. It has been eight years and my, my father is still in prison, now serving a life sentence for, for the alleged crime of separatism. The Chinese government accused, of, uh, accused my father of being an extremist and advocate for, of violence. These are nothing more than fabricated charges. My father had never incited violence, nor extremism, or promoted separatism as the Chinese government claims. He's a renowned scholar who dedicated his life and work to brokering peaceful dialogue among Uyghur and Han people. He was well loved by his colleagues and many students. That is why his arrest generated such an outcry from not only the international community, but also from many inside of China. On his website, Uyghur Online, he hosted articles that evaluated the disparities in the Uyghur region and opportunities or lack thereof for economic growth and development. He proposed constructive solutions to the Chinese government in efforts to develop the Uyghur region. Instead of engaging in constructive dialogue, the Chinese government locked him up. My father was sentenced in September 2014. While in prison, he was shackled, beaten, and denied food twice, each time for 10 days. And those are only the times that we were aware of. He has not seen a lawyer since his second trial in 2014, and our family has not been able to visit him since 2017. Now my family doesn't know where, whether he is even alive. That is also the case for many other Uyghurs who are being held captive by the Chinese government. A number of them were scholars like my father, and some were my father's students. At Kemrozi, a former student of my father's, was, accused, uh, was sentenced to four years in prison in 2014 for alleged crimes of separatism and endangering state security. Her association with my father and her contribution to the website Uyghur Online were reasons for these charges. And Atta Kamrozi's term ended in 2018, but she remained detained. Rahila Dawood is a renowned anthropologist, a th scholar and expert in Uyghur folklore and traditions. She has been missing for four years in the summer of 2021, the Chinese government finally confirmed that she is imprisoned, but shared no details of the charges against her or of her alleged crimes. Rahila Dawood's daughter, just like me, lives in the United States without her family, does not know her mother's current status, and is still fighting for her release. Yalqun Rozi, a scholar and a publisher, was sentenced in 2018 to 15 years of imprisonment for inciting subversion and ethnic hatred 
and Yalkunrozi published Uyghur language textbooks that authorities claim incorporated ethnic separatism and terrorism, even though the Chinese government had permitted use of his language textbooks for years. Until PRC officials suddenly ramped up their repression of the Uyghurs and their language and culture. I raise these names as examples in addition to my father's because it is important to remember that those imprisoned on fabricated charges and the over one million Uyghurs and other Turkic and Muslim majority people who have been arbitrarily detained in internment camps are not just numbers but real people who have parents, children, and friends. We need to lift up the names of individuals who are imprisoned in violation of their human rights and draw attention to their individual cases. We need to impress upon people who are unmoved by the Chinese government's pervasive and systematic repression in the Uyghur region that the detention of over one million people is not an abstract idea. It is a horrifying reality that is destroying the lives of individuals and families like mine, like Yalqun Rozis, like Rahila Dawoods, like Atikam Rozis. As I noted, I was last year in front of the commission eight years ago. Sadly, since then, the only changes in the Uyghur region have been for the worse. I'm grateful to see the US government's support for the Uyghur people once fully implemented and enforced the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act will counter the regime of state-sponsored forced labor that is taking place on a massive scale. But there's more that can be done to call for an end to the Chinese government's oppression against Uyghurs. This includes raising the names of Uyghurs who have been unjustly imprisoned and highlighting the human toll of the repressive policies. This can help personalize the large scale atrocities that are taking place in China. And hopefully the growing indignation and outcry will move governments that so far have remained silent on the repression of Uyghurs to action. Through building more united and concerted international pressure, we will have a greater chance at changing the Chinese government's human rights abuses. And I look forward to working with you to address these tough issues. And I really hope that in eight years, we're not having the same conversation again. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Ms. Lamo. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Nima Lamo. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. The opening ceremony of the 2020 Beijing Olympic will take place tomorrow, so it is urgent that we raise our voice today for those who have been silenced by the CCP. I'm the niece of late Chika Tenzindala Rumbichi. Tenzindala Rumbichi was highly respected Lama in our area, in Litam, Tam district. The, the, he earned respect through his social work, established school, clinics, urbanities, and old age homes. But the respect he earned amongst that common people angered the Chinese authorities. They firstly accused him for serious crime and committed him to life in prison in 2002. They were keep, he was kept in prison until he suddenly died in custody of 13, 13, 13 years old, years later. Then after Rinpoche died, the Chinese authority was said he was fake lama, a criminal, hurted too, so called social stability. My family and the local Tibetan weren't allowed to offer battle lamps. We weren't allowed to uh, organize public pride in memory of Rinpoche. Pictures of Rinpoche were banned in the town. My family was also threatened. Despite the difficult and hardship I skipped Tibetan in order to share the story of my late uncle. I left my family and six years old daughter behind. Last year in September, the 30s I took my 57 years old mothers and two brothers for questioning. They were kept in different places for seven days. They were questioned about how I escaped from Tibet. My, my mother was beat. They told that they were, they could easily kill her because of my mother. There were, they were questioned about how I escaped from Tibet. My mother was, she has responsible for making me stop my advocacy. They wanted her to say that Chikatan Dalai Rinpoche was fake Lama, that I'm, I don't know anything about the uh, 
uh, situations inside Tibet that I'm be used to outside forces. When my mother became ill, she tried to go to Tindu Hospital. At the first, the police didn't allow her to go. Later, they allowed her to go, but the police followed her there from her hotel to hospital, watching her entire time. I am very, very worried about my family's safety. All that my mom. If I continue to speak up out here, they will beat, arrest, or even kill members of my family. Today, Beijing is putting on a family face for the Olympic, but that isn't their real face. The Tibetan people have seen who they really are. We see it when they destroyed our temple, when they shout and beat us. We then make our religious leader disappearing, when they arrest and kill the innocent people. Our language and cultures are on the edge. For facing the crushing weight of the repression, Ch Chinese repression, the Benjamin don't have the freedom to speak the truth. Caring like this help those who are inside the Benjamin. Those messages will reach them and give them hope. While I grew up in Tibet, it was common to hear of Tibetan die in Chinese present without any justice. There were so many of them. Today, I want to bring the case of four political president to your attention. The first is Bechen Rinpoche. He was disappeared in 1995 at the age of six and has never been seen since. The second, Hadun Daba. A singer, he was given a six year sentence for singing a song absent Chinese role in Tibet. Third, Bonga, a young woman, he urged a small celebration of His Holiness the Dalai Lama's birthday. She was sentenced to seven years in prison. Lastly, please remember Lozo Tendu, a relative of mine. He was arrested alongside my late uncle, Tenzin Dalai Rinpoche and executed. Finally, my mother's health has always been an issue, and I would like to ask if there is any way my mom can be bring out of Tibet for half the reason. My family has a loss so much. Has anything you can do to help her, I would be greatly appreciate. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak. Thank you, and we certainly will follow up on your, your question in every possible way we can. Ms. Lowe. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Co-Chairman, and the distinguished members of the Commission, thank you so much for holding this hearing. Today, I will be telling you about the case of my husband, Ding Jiaxi, and the three other rights defenders who are currently in, in detention in China in connection to a crackdown after a private gathering in December 2019. My husband, Ding Jiaxi, is a human rights lawyer and activist. He met leading law scholar Xu Ziyong in Beijing in late 2011, and the two lead together the Chinese New Citizens Movement. Their ideas and activities centered on getting Chinese people to take their rights, written in the Chinese constitution seriously, practice them in everyday life, and become real citizens of the country. Their peaceful and lawful activities in 2012 and 2013, however, result, resulted in official prosecution they were sentenced to four years and 3.5 years in prison for charges of gathering a crowd to disrupt public order. After they were released from prison, Xu Ziyong and Ding Jiaxi resumed their activities to promote civil rights. They reached out to citizens around the country who share the same aspirations and continue to promote the growth of civil society. But their activism caught the attention of the authorities again after two-day private gathering in Xiamen with around 20 lawyers and friends 
on December 7 and 8, 2019. Chinese police detained Jin Jiaxi on December 26, 2019, and Xu Ziyong on February 15, 2020 and hold them under residential surveillance at a designated location, the RSDL. While held in RSDL, both men were subject to torture and ill treatment, including prolonged sleep deprivation, loud noise harassment, interrogation while being tightly strapped to an iron tiger chair, food and water restrictions, no exposure to sunlight and no showers. In June 2020, both men were formally arrested on suspicion of inciting subversion of state power and transferred to a detention center. In January 2021, Ding Jiaxi and Xu Ziyong finally were able to meet their lawyer by video after 13 and 11 months in secret detention. In August 2021, Chinese authorities indicted and charged them with subversion of state power, a more serious crime that could result in life imprisonment. Others were detained as part of Xiamen gathering crackdown and now still in detention are Chang Weiping and Xi, Li Qiaochu. Chang Weiping is a younger generation human rights lawyer. He was placed on the RSDL for 10 days in January 2020 after participating in the gathering and was, was sent to RSDL again in October 2020 under charge of subversion of state power. He was subject to brutal torture and was denied access to lawyer for 11 months. Ms. Li Qiaochu didn't attend the gathering, but was sent to RSDL for four months in 2020 simply because she was Xu Ziyong's fiance and was detained again in February 2021 under charge of inciting subversion of the state power for exposing Xu Ziyong's torture and disclosing the corruption of the detention center. She was denied access to lawyer for totally 10 months and now is suffering from severe mental health issue. Senator Mercury, Congressman McGowan, and members of the commission. I'm, I am an engineer by training and by profession. I would never have imagined that I would be here in Washington DC telling members of Congress about my husband and our friends who are under persecution. This is not something I have ever done before. I want to sincerely thank you for holding this hearing on the eve of Beijing Olympics and thank the commission for continue to advocate for police prisoner like my husband, Din Jiaxi. Thank you very much. So much appreciation to all of you for uh, sharing your, your experience, your, your insights, uh, your direct knowledge of the uh, horrific crimes against humanity that are underway. We are here at this moment, less than 24 hours before the Olympic Games begin, to say it is not acceptable to let the glitz and glamour of Olympic gold hide the egregious human rights crimes of the Chinese government. When we had the members of the Olympic Committee, the International Olympic Committee uh, uh, before us in our conversations that have, have followed up, uh, they have said that athletes can express themselves outside of the Olympic platform when they're receiving medals. On the other hand, Beijing Organizing Committee warned athletes that any behavior or speech that is against the Olympic spirit or Chinese laws and regulations are subject to certain punishment. Do we have any confidence, Ms. Sal, that athletes can exercise their freedom of speech during the Olympic Games? I doubt it. Uh, 
I read from the news that uh, athletes uh, were uh, compelled uh, to install a uh, app uh, designed for the uh, Olympic athletes, so everyone has the same app. Uh, we have uh, known uh, for a long time about China's censorship of its own citizens or any speech inside China that uh, um, that express any dis, um, dissent. So these uh, athletes, they will be closely watched through this app, and uh, they will be also be surrounded by minders uh, watching their movement and who they're going, uh, going with and what they're doing, uh, I say 24-7. There, there won't be any break. So, um, I would say uh, they they will uh, they will be risking uh, subject themselves to a lot of a risk if uh, some of them decide to speak up, and uh, at the same time, the Chinese people, the Chinese citizens. Uh, tight controls on expression uh, on the social media and the cross-board cross, cross board, uh, has been placed on them. They can't talk about anything that's disagreeable to the government. They can't, uh, as a manner, matter of fact, uh, the Chinese dissidents and active, uh, activists can't even hold a uh, count on the Chinese uh, uh, social media platforms. So um, that's, uh, that's the situation. Athletes will be uh, risking a lot if they decide to speak out. Uh, th thank, thank you. Which means that if individuals do speak up, uh, they know they're doing so at great risk, and uh, they will be exhibiting uh, the type of courage that so many of you and your family members and your friends have exhibited. Uh, Mr. Law, what recommendations do you have for Congress about how we can better support political prisoners in Hong Kong, given the new political legal environment there? Thank, Thank you so much, uh, Chair, for, for your question. Um, as I said in my speech, uh, there are numerous bills that are waiting to be passed uh, in Congress, including providing safe harbor, including um, providing security on, on internet freedom, and also the competes at that generally put pressure to the Chinese Communist Party. Um, for now, it's really difficult to directly do a lot of things or do something on the situation of Hong Kong's political prisoner, because Beijing uh, always holds a facade of rule of law in Hong Kong. And um, even though they have full control on the National Security Law Court, they appointed judges and the judges are obviously following orders, um, but it is, for them, they would definitely say that oh, it's uh, judiciary um, issues, and the the government has no uh, no intervention or over it. So definitely on 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 the surface level, they are saying that that they're nothing to do. But at the end of the day, um, the reason why Hong Kong um, ended up losing its freedom, that Beijing seems to be much more aggressive than ever, is because Beijing has confidence over its own system. Hong Kong used to be seen as a gateway or as an example for the Chinese Communist Party and the PRC to move towards liberalization. And for now, they, they feel good in staying in their totalitarian zone. So they no longer need that, uh, need, need that kind of like example of Hong Kong anymore. And they just treat Hong Kong just an ordinary city, Chinese city. So for now, it's really for us to gear up our pressure to the Chinese Communist Party to have good alliance, to have good policy, good global agenda, and coordinate global pushback. Thank, thank you. Ms. Ilham, I'm very struck about two items that I'd uh, like you to amplify your thoughts on if you would like to. One is the way in which apparel brands and retailers are complicit in forced labor uh, by utilizing uh, uh, products made with that forced labor. And second, the incredible impact of surveillance technology. 
which has created an Orwellian world where every movement is watched and recorded, uh, giving no personal space for expression or learning or reflection or advocacy, and uh, just your thoughts on those two pieces of the challenge. Thank you uh, for your question. Uh, first, I, I would like to note that the surveillance uh, tools that the Chinese government is using is directly benefiting the forced labor situation that's happening there. First of all, um, virtually speaking, we'll have to assume that the entire apparel industry or entire uh, any, doesn't matter what products, made in the Uyghur region should be tainted by forced labor. That's why we're passing the bill, we passed the bill for the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act because of the level of surveillance we're talking about. People are not free outside of their homes and people are not free inside their homes. I grew up having bugging devices in my living room. I grew up uh, being followed by Chinese policemen to shopping malls. I grew up having policemen constantly coming to our homes, traveling with us to different cities and putting us in, into house arrest. And back then, back then, things were not even that bad, and imagine now. So there is no, so the, the diligence mechanisms that work elsewhere in the rest of the world simply doesn't work in China. That's why if any companies claim that their item is free of forced labor, even though they're uh, directly sourcing from the Uyghur region, then they're lying or they're pretending to, uh, they're, they're pretending that they, they don't know what's going on. Um, but given the exposure of, uh, of, of the uh, situations in China, um, the brands and uh, corporations, they have the responsibility to know what's going on with their suppliers and where they're sourcing from. And also I want to note that um, many of the, like currently the IOC, uh, the, the Olympics is happening. And recently IOC had issued a statement um, saying that the Olympics uniforms are free of forced labor. Um, I, 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 I have to say that it's hardly a true statement because first of all, in the IOC's recent statement, it had only listed two brands. One is Anta, another one was, uh, was HYX, Heng Yuanxiang. And these, both of these two brands publicly announced that they have always been using Xinjiang cotton and they would continue to do so. And how would two brands who have uh, actively supported the use of Xinjiang cotton be free of forced labor, even though, virtually speaking, the entire uh, apparel industry is tainted by forced labor. And the IOC has failed to provide a transparent due diligence uh, that they have uh, c conducted in the Uyghur region and stating, uh, and they have failed to disclose their factory names, the auditor names, and they have failed to explain why they, they did not disclose those information. So I, there, there's a great challenge, but given that we have passed the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act, hopefully it will uh, very effectively, effectively reduce the forced labor, forced labor goods from entering the US. One more note, um, the Forced Labor Prevention Act is great. It prevents any, uh, it, it has a re rebuttable presumption that any, um, that basically makes sure that any goods cannot, from the Uyghur region cannot enter the US unless there is a clear evidence to support that. But we also have to note from the recent released report, uh, Laundering Cotton, released by the Sheffield Hallam University, has stated there are 53 manufacturers linked to over 100 international brands who have secondary links to the Uyghur region. If they could be linked to countries like India, to Indonesia, to Pakistan, to elsewhere, and they, those products, they could, they're not stated as source from the Uyghur region, but they have secondary links to the Uyghur region. They are transferred to a uh, second country, third country, then they end up in the U.S. market. So we need, to, we need to be cautious, and the brands need to be cautious, and they need to choose to be on the right side of the history. Thank you. Thank you very much. Co-Chair McGovern. Well, thank you very much. Um, and let me let me just say in response to the concerns you just raised, one of the things that uh, Senator Merkley, Senator Rubio, uh, Representative Smith, the entire commission are working on is to try to make sure that we provide adequate funding in our appropriations process so that the uh, the bill can actually be um, uh, enforced. And, and before I, I'm going to yield uh, the balance of my time to Speaker Pelosi, who has been here for this entire hearing, and I really, uh, I think it speaks volumes of her commitment to human rights. I just want to make one point, uh, uh, and that is uh, that I hope that the media that are covering these Olympics, uh, and we sent a letter to NBC, by the way, the commissioners here, 
uh, I hope that uh, they make a special effort to highlight the realities uh, in China. Uh, I hope that they don't see themselves as a vehicle simply to promote the propaganda that the government is going to put forward, where everybody's holding hands and singing kumbaya and everything is perfect. We know that that's not the case. Uh, but we know that that's what the Chinese government will want to do. Um, you know, it is not unreasonable for journalists, sports journalists as well, uh, to uh, highlight that a, there is a genocide going on, uh, to highlight the ethnic cleansing that is occurring with the Tibetans, that, that is highlighting the issues that uh, Nathan Law talked about in Hong Kong. Um, I think the Chinese government is counting on our media, the international media, to turn a blind eye to that. And I think that would be a, a tragedy. So this cannot be business as usual. Um, and I think there's an obligation, a moral obligation, uh, by those who are covering uh, these, uh, these uh, events uh, to make sure that people understand uh, the background in which they are occurring. And now I want to yield whatever time I have to the uh, distinguished Speaker of the House. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I will be brief because I want you to have the balance of your time. I want to thank you for the and, and the chairman for the opportunity to be with you today to hear the to have the benefit of this t very very important testimony. I want to acknowledge also the bipartisan nature of all of this. You mentioned Senator Rubio's work as well as Chris Smith participated. It's bicameral, both houses. It's bipartisan, both parties, and a reflection of the values of the American people. What I hear from our witnesses is a further evidence of the courage of the people who are committed uh, to freedom of expression and respect for human rights in China. What I see is the cowardice of the Chinese government, the cowardice of their actions, to take actions against family members because you are speaking out in other places, as some of you have mentioned the cowardice of the business community, not to be able to have confidence in their ability to compete, but to fold to the Chinese government without speaking out. I will again uh, thank all of you as well as Congresswoman Wexton for her leadership on the Uyghur situation and make this point, and I said this to our caucus this morning. When we talk about genocide of the Uyghurs, it's a death, a horrible thing, it's diabolical. It also has an impact on the workforce because when we say, talk about it, it is a human rights violation of the greatest magnitude. However, it is also unfairness to American workers or workers in other uh, economies because you're making people compete with slave labor. I've told this story in press events before. I talked to the former president of the United States, most recent one, when he was in Japan at G20, and I said, when you talk to President Xi, tell him of the bicameral, bipartisan awareness we have of what's happening to the Uyghurs and the genocide that is happening there. He called me the next day, the president did, former president did, and he said, I spoke to President Xi about that, and he said the Uyghurs like going to those camps. Really? So I would just say to the business community and, and to those who are afraid, and as they demonstrate their cowardice vis-a-vis -vis the Chinese government and the cowardice of the government, they're afraid of your values, your courage. What does it profit a country if it gains the whole world and suffers the loss of its soul? That can, we don't want that to happen to us. Thank you for challenging. This is a challenge to the conscience of the world. Thank you for your courage. And with that, in thanking you, I yield back to this, Mr. McGovern. Thank you very much. And, um, and I'll ask most of my questions in, in, the, in the second round. But I, I just want to reinforce what the speaker said. Um, uh, and again, remind uh, the business community um, that does business in the region that uh, the, the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act that uh, Senator Merkley Senator Rubio and Representative Smith uh, and I championed that is now law. Uh, we will make sure it is funded. 
we will make sure that it is enforced. Uh, and, um, and that the days of see no evil, hear no evil are over. Uh, uh, that uh, the corporations that turned a blind eye on what is happening um, to the Uyghurs and to others, um, they are complicit. I mean, I, and, you know, and I, I these are, we're all speaking in very strong terms here, but it is true. Um, and I get it, everybody wants to make money. Uh, but the bottom line is we will make sure that the American people know which companies are complicit, and people will make choices based on that. I'm not drinking Coca-Cola, as I said at the beginning of this, because of their involvement uh, right now. But there are clothing companies, there are uh, footwear companies that go right down the list. They know who they are, um, and so things have to change. And let me yield back my time, and um, I'll, go, I'll go to the second round for questions. Uh, thank you very much, and a special thank you to Speaker Pelosi for, for being here to, to lend your, your long advocacy and, and your, the prestige of your position uh, to this important point. And I think your, your phrase will stick in my head, what does it benefit a nation to gain the world but lose its soul? You said it more poetically than I did, but um, I think that sums up what we're, we're looking at. Thank you. Uh, we are turning to uh, Congressman Smith. Congressman Smith, we're checking. I know you're joining us electronically. If we don't have you, we'll continue and come back to you. Congresswoman Wexton. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you also to Chairman McGovern. I really appreciated your opening remarks because it's important that we remember that, that you know, a lot of people conflate the Chinese people or Asian people with, with the actions of the CCP, and we should never let that happen, and, and this has been a huge increase in anti-Asian hate, and we want to make sure that we get that under control and make it very clear that that is not permitted. Um, Ms. Ilhan, I did appreciate your remarks, especially about the Uyghur forced labor Prevention Act, um, and I, I, I share with you the concerns about the, the possible shortcomings of that legislation, and that's why I introduced the Uyghur Forced Labor Disclosure Act, which would require companies that are publicly traded to, to actively uh, investigate their supply chains for forced labor and in make, ensure that there is no forced labor used in the, in the production of those goods, and if it is, um, you know, to, to disclose that, and also to disclose if they're unable to, to be able to to, just to determine one way or the other. Um, and that would be you know, publicly in their SEC documents. That has passed the House of Representatives twice. Um, and if, if anybody in the Senate is interested in picking that up, I certainly would be very interested in working with you to make that happen. I'm glad that we are holding this hearing today on the eve of the opening ceremony for the 2022 Beijing Genocide Games, because the PRC wants nothing more than to distract the world from its crimes against humanity in Tibet, its anti-democratic crackdown in Hong Kong, and the ongoing genocide happening in Xinjiang. I'm disappointed that we, as a, com as a commission, were unable to compel U.S. sponsors of the Beijing games like Airbnb, Coca-Cola, Procter & Gamble, Intel, and others to withdraw their support, even though we tried. It's very clear that they are prioritizing their bottom lines over everything else, including human rights. Now, I never expected the IOC to do the right thing. They are a deeply corrupt organization. Um, but, but their treatment and what they did in, in, as accomplices to the disappearance of Peng Shui was disappointing and even undershot my very low expectations. Um, I, I want to thank Speaker Pelosi for joining us here today. You have been a champion on, on human rights in China in your entire tenure in Congress. And I also want to thank you for, for when I introduced my, my, um, my resolution condemning the IOC for their treatment of Peng Shui for getting that to the floor so quickly where it passed the House of Representatives on a unanimous vote, on a recorded unanimous vote, which does not happen very frequently. So it shows you that about the wonderful bipartisan cooperation that we have on this, on this legislation. Um, I do have some questions for, for some of the witnesses. Um, Ms. Ms. Sao, um, you, you testified that it, it was really that, that the, the CCP's treatment of 
of Peng Shui was, was basically following their playbook, um, you know, the way that they, that, they, um, that they treated her when she came forward. Can you, can you describe that a little bit more fully and also describe what is the status of the Me Too movement in China? Is this something that, that many um, of the of women who come forward face the same kind of, of effects? Yeah. Thank you, Congresswoman uh, Winspan. And thank you for the resolution uh, you introduced uh, on condemning IOC's uh, complicity in the Peng Shui incident. Um, I, uh, speaking of uh, China's playbook, I wrote a uh, article two months ago <clears throat> called What Waits Peng Shui. Initially, I didn't uh, feel like uh, I have too much to say about Peng Shui, but, uh, but uh, a month into um, the incident, I feel like uh, I had a lot to offer. What I have to offer is this playbook that uh, as a human rights activist, I'm so familiar with. Many of us are very familiar with this. So um, there is a clear pattern and clear components in this playbook when China deals with the dissent or cases, human rights cases, that causes wide international attention. So I, in my article, I gave a few examples. If I could just briefly um, tell you a couple other stories, very, you'll very know briefly. everybody briefly, here. Because I do have know. some questions for the other panelists as well. If you, could, if you could make it brief, that would be great. Yeah, so for example, when human rights lawyer Wang Yu uh, was given the uh, Human Rights Award by uh, American Bar Association, China actually sent a false, false uh, lawyer letter to ABA denouncing the word in Wang Yu's name. Uh, and uh, in the case of uh, Gui Minghai, uh, the, the Hong Kong bookseller um, who was detained, who was a, a sw uh, Swede, uh, has a Swedish um, uh, citizenship. And he was made to go on TV to confess that uh, um, he so voluntarily staying in China and uh, uh, he does not want to return to uh, Sweden and uh, he denounces his uh, Swedish citizenship. So in Peng Shui, uh, we have seen this. Of course, the, the first uh, component in this playbook is censorship. And then there's uh, all matters of uh, different uh, denials, whatever the allegations are. And then there's a public uh, uh, TV uh, confession. A organization called the Safeguard uh, Defenders did a lot of uh, in-depth research I'm sorry, on I'm that. I'm going to need to replay my time because I, thank you very much. But you've given some very interesting examples of how that playbook has been used against other, uh, other people in, in China. Um, Ms. Ilhan. What happens to the children of these people who get who get detained? Because you know sometimes it's both parents in a household get detained. What happens to their to their minor children when they're detained? Um, from camp survivors or family members of former detainees, I have learned that many of those children whom uh, their parents are detained, they get sent to orphanages um, or certain types of boarding school if they're slightly older. Um, and a lot there of in, a lot is of is there indoctrination by the CCP taking place at these boarding schools? Yes, at those schools they learn Chinese, speak only Chinese, not allowed to speak in Uyghur. They eat Chinese food, dress like Chinese, sing Chinese songs, learn Chinese poetries. That's what I learned from the testimonies that I uh, from former detainees and camp survivors. Thank you very much. I'll yield back okay. with that. Uh, thank you very much, Congresswoman. And uh, I believe next up is uh, Congressman Steele. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Chairman and ranking members. And it is really unacceptable that Chinese Communist Party is allowed to host the Winter Olympics. I have repeatedly called on the International Olympic Committee to move the 2022 Winter Olympics out of Beijing and has pushed corporate sponsors to use their advertising 
during the games to shine a light on human rights abuses happening through China. The CCP continues to repress the people of Hong Kong, Uyghurs, and Tibetans. They all repeatedly try to intimidate Taiwan and their allies. I've offered an amendment to the American America Competes Act that resumes diplomatic relations with Taiwan, but majority ruled it was not in order. Recently, Queen Gang, China, China's ambassador to the United States, issued a warning of military conflict between the two nations over Americans' continued, continued support of free and independent Taiwan. This should concern every one of us. Thank you all today for your stories and standing up to the CCP. To all the witnesses uh, that the United States must stand and fight for the people of Hong Kong and those being oppressed and prosecuted by the CCP for speaking out against human rights abuses. So my question is, anybody can answer here, how discouraging it is when you see elected officials across Western con con uh, count countries and global corporate companies turn a blind eye to the CCP and Chairman Xi, um, Xi Jinping. So what do you think about that? Yes, yeah, so maybe can, I can jump in to um, answering Congresswoman's uh, question. Um, as I said in my speech, it's really disgusting to, to, to see a lot of big corporations and some of the uh, country's leaders to, well, literally rolled a red carpet for this uh, Winter Olympics, while they obviously knowing that there is a genocide ongoing, that a lot of people are suffering, and they know that by doing so, they are unable to address these problems um, so for me, and it is especially disheartening that it is not just about uh, the Winter Olympic or the Chinese human rights violation, it's about how we can retain the integrity and uh, the idea of democratic values, while we obviously, obviously knowing that uh, China is actively redefining the definition of democracy and trying to say that the totalitarian system triumph um, our democratic system. So for now, I think we, we need more values in our actions. We need more value-based diplomacy, and we need more um, alliance and coalition that like-minded countries can work, work and act together. And some of the democratic countries, if they send delegations of high officials to the Winter Olympic, it definitely ruins this kind of like collaboration and a dedication that we all put in protecting uh, democracy. And let's not forget, we are in a democratic backsliding in the second decade. The, for the past 10 years, 20 years, democracy is losing ground in the world. And one of the major uh, components is that we were too complacent to the rights of authoritarianism, especially to China. And now we should change that. And the change starts uh, with all democratic countries getting together and at least to boycotting events like this. So um, American leadership is really important and I'm very grateful for all the bipartisan support that we as Hong Kong democratic activists receive and your support to our democratic movement and addressing human rights violation in some other regions in China, including to the Uyghurs, to the Tibetans and to the Taiwanese. Thank you, Mr. Lau. I sent a letter, a letter out to 17 Olympic corporate sponsors to just use a little bit of their advertising of money to let the whole world know that what kind of human rights violation that um, CCP is being committed because it's it's really important and they have a big platform and this is just perfect timing to do that. I never got any responses from any of those corporate you know corporate sponsors. So my second question is, what do these CEOs and elected leaders need to do? Those protect those minority. Uh, groups and vulnerable population in China because we don't see that in the world and they are not transparent and they've been hiding everything. So unless we hear from witnesses today that we don't know exactly what's going on except the, just some of the news matters that you know we read. So anybody can answer that and I really appreciate it. I'd like to take this question, please. 
Uh, thank you for yes. this wonderful question. Um, first of all, I want to follow up with, uh, connected to the previous question you had asked, you had raised, that it's absolutely disgusting that the uh, corporations have chose to, to, to turn a blind, blind eye, but it is very saddening, but also we need to be positive <laughs> because only being positive and then there's hope and then there's change. Um, we also need to focus on those uh, brands and companies that have chosen to do the right thing. For for instance, Marks and Spencer, ASOS, uh, Reformation, um, um, New Look, these brands who own a um, billion uh, dollars revenues have uh, committed to the, uh, the brand commitment to exit the Uyghur region. That means that it is difficult to end their ties to the Uyghur region, but it is feasible. So we need to uh, reward those brands by showing them that this is uh, that the telling them that this is they are doing the right thing and so we can show a good example go show a good example to these brands like um, uh, Anta HYX who publicly advocated to the use of uh, Xinjiang cotton and like brands like Hugo Boss Uniqlo had refused to sign uh, the the call to action that was uh, launched proposed by our coalition to end Uyghur forced labor, where we asked the brands to exit the Uyghur region at every level of their supply chain. We have different brands choose to choose different paths. And the CEOs, they are full aware of what is happening. They're, so the coalition to end Uyghur forced labor, we have reached out to hundreds of brands. We have sent letters to hundreds of brands, informing them what is happening, providing service that this is what you can do. This is what you shouldn't be doing. This is how you can do better. And, we have received replies from many brands. I'm not going to name who exactly here. Some of them said, yes, we're aware of this. We want to do good, but we can't commit to, to, your, uh, to, to the call to action that you have proposed. Some of them said, we will continue. Some, some of them will, will say, we, we would like to stop uh, sourcing from the Uyghur region, but also some of them would ignore, ignore us and stop responding, even though we are uh, we are more uh, more than aware that they have received our letters and they know exactly what is happening. So we need to urge those CEOs, those corporate leaders, to make them to follow the good examples, to do the right thing, to stop their compl complicity in the Uyghur forced labor. 22% of the cotton production might be from the Uyghur region, but the rest of the 80% is from elsewhere. That means there are alternative ways. There are alternative, um, uh, they can source... Uh, in other, uh, in other places, there are a better solution. And we need to propose that to those brands. That's why governments around the world also need, uh, I suggest governments uh, around the world to also reach out to those corporate leaders and let them know this is not an action that we should be encouraging and what is the right thing to do. Thank, Thank you very you. much. But I thought this is a just perfect timing and they have a big platform to know, let the world know that exactly what's going on inside of China, and they can just spend a little bit of money. But Mr. Chairman, my time is up, and thank you. I yield back. Thank you very much, Congresswoman Steele. And uh, we'll check now and see if Congressman Swazi is online. And uh, since he's not responding, we're going to turn to uh, Congressman McGovern, uh, who courteously yielded his time to Speaker Pelosi, well, and then I'll, I'll yield my time to you. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Again, thank you for your uh, incredible leadership on all this. Um, Ms. Uh, Lamo, um, we want to thank you for your tireless advocacy on behalf of your uncle. Um, Tenzin, uh, Delic Rinpoche's case was well known in Congress, um, and I remember the sadness I felt when I was informed of his death in custody. Uh, how has your advocacy for your uncle's case affected your family in Tibet? Uh, do you here in the United States receive any pressure from the Chinese government or party, directly or indirectly, uh, to stop? Thank you for this question. Thank you for continuing to uh, mention his story. And it's very important for us to continue to mention and their story and for the other uh, organized and all community. Um, yes, um, I got a lot of um, uh, uh, warn from Chinese 
and to my uh, uh, relatives from my amounts. Uh, <clears throat> they always told me, if you are continue uh, to speak up for the story inside Tibet, there will be um, uh, maybe like do do something like kill me something because they say they have a lot of spy around the world so uh, may probably uh, your daughter have dangerous because we know every uh, single uh, time what he, she is doing there and you know if she continue us like your brother like tens of dollar rumbachin you know people are just uh, use them after few day few years they will all uh, like nothing changed the china is going to very uh power in on the world so there's nothing will be changed if she speaks something like that it doesn't work let's to talk to your um doctor that they will um keep to mm, sorry that that's that you uh, watching that you see like a so she uh says that uh, uh the authorities always say your daughter is advocating in whatever Nima does, they follow and they know exactly everything and uh, they could easily stop her and uh, um, endanger her very easily. So they always warn. We have spies all over the world and uh, 24 hours uh, watching and we know uh, everything that uh, she is doing. Then the Yundi Nisambala Purnongi, Maman to Gajawala, Ashulogi, Jacob Dongoji, Third and Nisig, Adi Lajawa, Shabuchu, Tend the Yundi, Kunamba la Gita, Dunda Gangi used Mutuna, Zamb Ningidinja Gila Shina, Hansang Pentodo, Shuani. The Tibetans inside Tibet uh, look to the outside world to tell their story and to raise um, speaking about them. And especially they look to the United States as a leader in the world in speaking out against the oppressed. And everything that you do to speak out and raise and uh, awareness about what is happening inside Tibet helps the Tibetans. Thank you. Um, Sophie Luo, um, you know, we are sorry that you remain separated from your husband, uh, Ding Jia uh, Shi. Uh, when Chinese security authorities initially took him into custody along with legal advocate Xu Zhiyang, they placed them under a police measure called residential surveillance at a designated location, uh, RSDL, for about uh, six months. Can you explain what RSDL is and what should the UN and the US government be doing about this practice? Thank you, Congressman McGovern. The ISDL is a new term that they added into the criminal law in 2012 and uh, supposed to be very light uh, uh, political, uh, sorry, criminal procedure to put the detainees um, at home or some de designated location. But Chinese Communist Party right now systematically used it as an incommunicado detention. Anyone sent into RSDL right away put into a, a location which no one knows where it is and uh, all the setup of the location is just a very black black room with the with the lights on 24 hours with person watch you one by one and without any communication with outside world 
and the, the policemen can do anything they like to the person who were detained. Like in this case, Ding Jiaxi was uh, uh, put into 10 days noise harassment, very loud noise ha harassment for 10 days, 24 hours. Everyone can hear around, but no, no one outside can hear. And Chang Weiping put into the tiger chair continually over 10 days. So they can do whatever they want. And also Li Qiaochu, they, put, they threatened her by all kinds of dirty languages. So right now, uh, safety, safeguard uh, the NGO, they did an investigation on ISDL. Basically, systematically, they can use this measure on any people they, don't, they want to get a coerced confession, uh, like reporters, like diplomats, any, anyone, only if they want to get a, a, a coerced confession, they use this measure. So it's very evil and widely used by CCP now. Thank you. And um, if I could just ask um, my friend Nathan Law, um, thank you for the um, update on Joshua Wong. Uh, we continue to keep him in our, our prayers, and we hope that he um, can be safe and released soon. Uh, but can you provide us an update on the 47, uh, the pro-democracy people charged with subversion in February 2021 over their roles in an unofficial primary election held in 2020? Um, thank, thank you so much, uh, Congressman, for your um, question. Uh, well, the 47 um, case uh, was a case that uh, these uh, political campaigners, they were charged under the national security law. Um, allegedly under the charge of sedition, um, that they participated in a primary election. And the government says that if you participate in a primary election and you want to get the majority, and by getting a majority, you are possibly blocking government's bill, you are committing a subversive act. So let's just imagine every single political party in the West or in democratic countries would host a primary in order to get the best lineup for elections. And if it happens in Hong Kong, that would be a crime that would make you to be behind bars for years or even decades. And that's how drastic and how draconian the national security law is. Um, for now, uh, most of them are being held behind bars for uh, almost a year without um, knowing when the trial uh, would officially begin. And um, no one knows where the, the uh, sentencing would be so it is a very precarious uh, situation. And for them, especially for Joshua Wong, Benny Tai, and Jimmy Lai, um, uh, the trio uh, have been named by the um, governments, by the Chinese government's mouthpiece newspapers for multiple times that uh, they are probably receiving the harshest sentencing. Uh, it may take decades for them to get out of the jail, and some of them would. Well, we doubt that whether the government wants them to leave the jail alive. So it is a really serious situation. And keep their names on headlines, keep their names on your statements, keep bringing up the situation of Hong Kong and what they've encountered are really important for their own safety. Thank you. And let me, I, I, I know my time is up. I just want to just say a couple of things here. Um, first of all, I want to thank the staff of the China Commission. Um, uh, they are an incredible group of people who are experts uh, on a whole range of human rights issues and China issues. Uh, you don't always see them, but they're behind the scenes, and um, they are responsible for putting together our annual report, which will hopefully come out very soon. Uh, but their research is second to none, and so I, I just want to I I thank them. Secondly, as Speaker Pelosi pointed out, uh, you know, that this is a commission that is a bipartisan commission. Um, you know, anybody who's observing Washington know that our politics is pretty polarizing. I mean, we, we have trouble agreeing on what to have for lunch, right? But on this issue, on these fundamental human rights issues, we are together uh, with Senator Rubio, uh, you heard Representative Steele, Representative um, uh, Smith, uh, and others. Um, I mean, we are 
we are deeply concerned about the deteriorating situation on so many levels. Um, and we hear from people, and we hear from, uh, uh, in China, and from their families that are all over the world all the time about how awful the situation is. Uh, it, it, it has to change. I really, it, it is in the government of China's interest, I think, to change uh, its approach. Uh, and, um, and the final thing I'm going to say is I, there are not words, there are not, that are not, that are not, there are not enough bad words in the dictionary uh, to describe my feelings about the International Olympic Committee uh, and their decision to locate the Olympics uh, in China at this particular moment. It's disgusting. It, 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 it's hard to wrap your head around what they were thinking. Um, and when we met with them, they told us, well, they, they don't deal with politics, they don't deal with this, and it, you know, it's, it, they have all these rules and regulations. I mean, I, the idea that you could be holding an Olympics in a country that is engaged in a genocide, I mean, boy, if I, I can't believe that that in and of itself wasn't enough for them to take a pass on China. Now, we want China's behavior to change, but at this moment, it hasn't. Uh, and so um, I think you're hearing from all of us this great sense of outrage over the fact, not only what is going on in China, but that these games are proceeding. We honor our athletes, athletes all around the world. We honor them. We wish them well. We hope that they are safe. But, but the fact that, uh, that this is happening now, it's unconscionable. Uh, and again, I, I hope the media will report the truth about what is going on in China and not merely be a vehicle to promote propaganda uh, that the Chinese government uh, is going to put forward. Because uh, the realities in China are very, very harsh. Uh, and I hope our companies that have been doing business in a way that has taken advantage of the forced labor situation, I hope it stops now. We passed a law that will force you to stop. Uh, but quite frankly, um, anybody with a conscience should have stopped doing business in a region that uses forced slave labor a long, long time ago. Uh, and so with that, I will yield back to the chairman. Uh, thank you. And uh, do you have additional questions you will want to ask in a second round of questioning? I have a couple more, but I can, but I can, you know, I, I, I didn't know if anyone else was wanting to. I don't believe we have anyone else in the queue. I do have uh, uh, two questions I'd like to ask. Uh, but I, if you'd like, do you want to finish or you want to come back to your additional questions? If, if, I, if, I, if I can finish, I'll, I'll, sure. I'll finish. Okay. okay. Um, uh, Ms. Um, Sao, um, I want to thank you for your testimony and dedication on the case of Hung Shu Ai. And I'm concerned that her allegation of sexual assault against a senior Chinese official will not be investigated by the justice system and that she may not receive any needed uh, uh, psychosexual support as a victim of trauma. Uh, Chairman Merkley and I wrote a letter to the IOC noting that it, that it was inappropriate for an IOC official to claim that she is, quote, doing fine uh, based on a single remote video call. We worry that the IOC's focus on optics may make it harder for her to receive justice or support. Uh, I guess my first question to you is, do you agree and how can we uh, help her get uh, get these? Um, well, I uh, I predicted two months ago. I made a few predictions in my article uh, after I carefully studied the situation. I predicted that uh, uh, she won't be uh, allowed to leave the country. She will be completely um, uh, disappeared from the public view. She will be forced to deny the, the allegations. And uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, all of my predictions uh, transpired. So I, um, I think uh, Peng Shui will never let free if we don't uh, apply uh, serious pressure. 
And uh, I don't think uh, uh, China will do anything about the Zhang Gaoli uh, or the investigation. So it's uh, interesting to see uh, what will happen next, uh, whether um, how the uh, WTA um, situation will be resolved or WTA will stand up uh, for women, for Peng Shui. Um, so um, it's a, the, 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 the playbook we talked about really uh, doesn't really give us an answer at this point because uh, uh, there's the WTA decision. It's not just the Peng Shui. If it's just Peng Shui, China will um, put her anywhere. She, it, look, China doesn't have to put her um, in jail to, to uh, uh, she can live freely and happily in her whole home, yet not free at all. So President Thomas Bach stated that the IOC does not have any authority to intervene or speak out on behalf of human rights in the host country. I mean, that's what we were told by, we met with them. And yet he personally intervened with Peng and said that he plans to meet her during the Olympics. Do you think that this shows that perhaps the IOC can indeed step up on a, on a human rights case? Um, I think uh, IOC is a, the most uh, um, troubling sign about the IOC came uh, at the, on the day of uh, December 2nd. Uh, they made the second uh, statement within 24 hours of the WTA announcing its uh, uh, suspension of the tournament in China. In that IOC statement, the IOC actually used the Chinese government, the CCP language. So that I was like, uh, are they actually actively coordinating with the CCP to suppress the Peng Shui matter? So if you uh, have a, that kind of a, uh, idea, uh, down on that kind of a realization, you know that uh, IOC is not just uh, glossing over things. IOC is uh, active participation of the suppression. Against that backdrop, what would the IOC do? Well, IOC will not do anything. IOC is uh, right, because China can't use its uh, uh, state media to do the uh, uh, propaganda campaign because it has no credit and no actual effect. So IOC took pl the place of a CCTV, Xinhua, Global Times. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, uh, IOC will have a, uh, that dinner or not, whatever. It's all part of the propaganda package to pop up the idea that uh, uh, Peng Shui is fine. Peng Shui is not fine, right. precisely because their efforts well, you know, the IOC, those that go, that go along to get along under these circumstances are complicit. Absolutely. And, um, and I think that needs to be stated for the record. Just one, my final question to uh, Ms. Ilham. Um, I um, welcome back to the commission. And um, uh, as you mentioned, we recently passed the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act. Um, and uh, the, uh, before that was the Uyghur Human Rights Policy Act. Um, where you're going to be dealing with the Competes Act. Um, uh, and uh, your testimony reminds us that behind these legislative initiatives are real human beings with families whose rights and aspirations are being denied by the Chinese government. Can you just speak a little bit in a little bit more detail of the experience of the names you mentioned, such as um, uh, Rahil, Rahil, Rahilu uh, Dawut? Thank you, uh, uh, Congressman McGovern. So Rahila Dawood uh, is a renowned anthropologist. She had also uh, participated in Harvard program in the past, and she's a renowned scholar and well loved and respected by uh, not only not only the international academic field, but also uh, she's well respected in China as well. And she disappeared in 2017, just like many other Uyghurs and other Kazakhs and Muslim majority peoples, Muslim majority peoples, and um, her daughter had 
uh, also been speaking out, just like me, you know, on behalf of her mother to, to, uh, to, to in, in order to ask for a release for her mother. She didn't know where, where her mother was since 2017 until very recently, summer of 2021. Finally, the Chinese government said, yes, she has been in prison, but did not reveal any information on what charges, uh, what, what kind of uh, uh, crimes she has been charged with, what are some of the alleged crimes, and where she has, where she's being held, how long she's going to be charged. Um, Rahil Dawood's daughter, Akida Polat, doesn't know anything. Mm. She, the only information or confirmation she got from the Chinese government is that her mother is in prison. And it goes by it goes to so many other Uyghur children and uh, families in the diaspora. Uh, I I know someone who has over seventy family members, distant family members, have been sent to either re-education camps or prisons, or some of them are even in forced labor camps. So we're we're not talking about one person two people or 10 families anymore. We're talking about millions, hundreds of thousands of families right here that they don't know where their family members are. I don't know if my father is alive. The last time I heard of him was 2017. I knew he was at the Urumqi first prison. But since then, family visits, there was, there was none. And we don't know if, if he has been transferred to a prison, if he has been transferred to a camp, if he has been killed, if he had died with the health issues, we don't know. And just like Rahila Dawood's case. Well, thank, thank, you for, thank you for sharing your personal story, but also uh, others. I, I, I think it's important that you know, the, 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 the number of atrocities are so huge in terms of numbers that you know, we're constantly being given numbers and facts and statistics. And, and sometimes I, I worry we, we lose our human ability to feel uh, what that all means. And there are individuals. Uh, behind each one of those numbers, uh, and there are families, yeah. Yes, thank you for bringing that up. So the reason that I specifically put few names in my speech, in my testimony, was because I, 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 want, to, I want people to stop only thinking of what's happening as an abstract idea. Right. I want to put a uh, face to the names. I want to put a picture in front of people's heads. I want, and I also want to urge you know, the China Commission you know, to do one thing for me, for the Uyghurs. For as, as many uh, names you can remember of those missing Uyghur families, detainees, please try to remember them or write them down. If Whenever you have a chance to meet with Chinese officials, please raise individual cases. The Chinese, I also want the Chinese government to stop thinking that this is just an abstract idea of, oh, it's just one million people out there. No, we, we need to emphasize to them you're locking up family members just like your own family members. They're individual human beings that have father has uh, that have mothers that have children. Like, please raise individual cases with their names. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. You back to you. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, I just want to echo Co-Chair McGovern's point about thanking you all for sharing your your personal uh, stories and putting faces to the oppression. I want to close with this question to whoever on the panel would like to address it. I was reading an article by an independent uh, journalist, Melissa Chan. She published it, I think, two days ago. And she noted that at the 2008 Beijing Summer Olympics, uh, journalists were free to travel the country. Uh, I uh, thought about how she described um, the circumstances then and a trip that uh, 10 members of the Senate made a couple years later where uh, we met uh, reporters who were lo no longer required to live in official housing where they were carefully supervised. They no longer had tenders or and folks who were with them constantly. We met environmental advocates who were issuing reports on companies that were dumping uh, their industrial pollutants directly into rivers, and, and there was this emerging environmental movement. We met folks who uh, told us about a slight improvement in uh, freedom to uh, worship, uh, and others who talked about uh, improvements in the ability to advocate for workers' conditions. Um, and uh, now we sit here in the year 2022, and all of that is gone. And in her article, she challenges us with this question. 
And that is, is the word an authoritarian state still adequate to describe what has happened in, in China under General Secretary Xi Jinping? He became General Secretary in 2012, and here is what some of the things that she mentioned. Authorities are locking up activists that they once championed as advocating for the people. We have a cult of personality around the General Secretary. We have amplification of uh, propaganda that um, puts forth a, a glorious uh, a redacted national history and emphasizes the role of uh, victims of foreign forces. We have massive development of a surveillance state. We have the disconnection from uh, the social media instruments used around the world and replaced by Chinese controlled uh, social media. We have uh, massive oppression of minority populations to the point of conducting uh, genocide against the Uyghur population. We have a systematic crushing of free speech and free assembly. And we have a uh, very significant buildup of military expansion abroad. And so she asked the question, is this an authoritarian state or is this now a fascist state with all of those characteristics? And um, as she asked that question in that article, I was thinking about the comparison to 1936 when the Olympics were hosted by Hitler and where he used the glitz and glory of Olympic gold to hide his already horrific acts. And then because the world paid no attention uh, to those acts, uh, he was uh, an emboldened uh, spree of, of, um, uh, of enormous uh, assaults on humanity in, in the years that followed. And I guess our plea is to the world is let us not repeat or echo uh, 1936 when the world ignored uh, the acts of Hitler. And let us not ignore today the acts of General Secretary Xi Jinping. But uh, so I ask you kind of broadly, are we now talking about a, a fascist state? And should we start thinking of, of China's under the rule of General Secretary Xi Jinping in that context? If anyone would like to speak to that. Um, I, yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> yes, please go ahead. Yeah, I, I would like to uh, just make a quick comment on the difference between an authoritarian state and a totalitarian state or fascist state. Uh, of course, I, I'm not a scholar uh, of politics, uh, political science, but uh, if you look at uh, Taiwan back in the 60s, 70s, uh, or look at Korea, uh, South Korea around the same time, and many other countries, uh, or uh, South Africa, a authoritarian state still allows a small uh, uh, part of uh, civil society alive. For example, a small slice of uh, 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 vote uh, elected uh, uh, Congress member uh, and a small portion of uh, free uh, press, uh, but uh, 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 that allows the civil society to grow just a little bit. Um, but uh, China is not that place. China it has f gone far past the, the state of uh, uh, authoritarianism. Thank you. Thank you. And I believe Mr. Law was uh, prepared to speak. Um, um, yeah, yeah, thank, thank you, you. Uh, Congressman, for your question. I think addressing um, the PRC under the Chinese Communist Party as a fascist regime is not an overstatement. Uh, if you have been keeping up um, the situation in mainland China, they've just uh, they, they've list um, they they have a list of core socialist values back in the days when uh, Xi Jinping just uh, resumed power, and they list democracy, freedom, rule of law as their core values, but in in reality, we all know that they are not practicing these things. They are just using the outer shell um, that uh, these great terms um, come coming with uh, all this legitimacy and authority and substitute them into um, the things that 
literally undermining these values. And a lot of scholars studying the fascist regime claims that this double speak is kind of a, 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 a classic trait, a uh, characteristic of a fascist regime. Um, that they use terms, um, that they steal the definition of these terms to fit into their agenda. And to claim that China under the Chinese Communist Party is a totalitarian government is also not an overstatement. And to a certain degree is even an understatement if your own imagination about, authorita uh, about totalitarian government is an Orwellian style 1984 um, government. Because China has already surpassed that standard. They're, they're much more technologically advanced and sophisticated in terms of using their technology to control people's life, to impose social control. Just look at the social credit, uh, social, uh, credit score scheme that is still practicing in certain cities. Just look at all these surveillance tactics in Xinjiang and in Tibet. Um, these are appalling and much more draconian than um, uh, the, 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 the situation depicted in 1984. So for me, um, understanding China is really important. We have been overlooking a lot of developments that really signaling its rise as a totalitarian power, and we cannot afford to overlook it and to understate what is happening now. Uh, thank you. Did anybody else wish to comment? I'll turn then to uh, Congresswoman Wexton. Well, I think we just lost Congresswoman Wexton. Um, she had had one last question she wanted to ask. Uh, so we're reaching the conclusion of this hearing and uh, approximately 6 to 7 a.m. tomorrow morning uh, here on East Coast time, the Opening ceremonies uh, will begin uh, for the Beijing Winter Olympics. And we hope the world will pay attention to the horrific acts occurring in China at the same time as the opening ceremony uh, initiates. I appreciate all of you bringing your, your, your knowledge, your experience, your expertise, your organizing. Uh, to bring to bear on this on this conversation. I know that uh, You all either individually or within your circle of friends and families have seen much tragedy from the uh, From the exercise of the power of the Chinese government in the various forms we've addressed today So your testimony is doing great value uh, in in the world the record will remain open until the close of business on Friday, February 11th. For any items members would like to submit for the record or for additional questions for our witnesses, I do ask unanimous consent to submit the, uh, the article uh, that I referred to by Melissa Chan. Without objection, that article will be included in the record. This hearing is adjourned. Thank you all so much. Um, we're really honored to be able to have the National Governors Association and governors across the country with us here today um, to be able to meet directly with the president and the vice president. And we've really had a strong relationship with governors, as you all know, throughout the course of our administration. And we're excited to continue that in year two. 
So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to New Jersey Governor Phil Murphy, Vice Chair of the National Governors Association, to kick off our business session. Julie, thank you. Mr. President, Madam Vice President, uh, on behalf of the National Governors Association, our Chair, Governor Hutchison, uh, and each and every one of us, it's an honor to be with you. Uh, we cherish and value the relationship that we share with this administration. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, First Lady, for being with us last night, uh, which meant a great deal. Madam Vice President, you made history and you continue to make history every day. It was great having you in New Jersey a short while ago. I know I speak on behalf of all of the states where you each have visited, Mr. President, as well. Uh, the relationship that each of us as individual governors have with this administration is critically important. And I could say more broadly, I know the chairman, Governor Hutchison, would endorse this. The relationship that the National Governors Association has with this administration and with each of you personally is extremely uh, important uh, and existentially important, I would say, for each of us and for the association. So on behalf of all of us, God bless you both, and thank you so much for everything you do. Thank you, and uh, may I uh, uh, add to uh, Governor Murphy's uh, comments, and thank you for uh, the greeting that you extended. Uh, Mr. President, uh, I would also extend greetings on behalf of all the governors and Madam Vice President the same. Uh, thank you for hosting us today in the East Room. Uh, this annual tradition has really never been more important and timely. And uh, during our weekend meeting that we've just uh, concluded, uh, your administration has been extraordinarily helpful to us. Secretary Buttigieg uh, joined us for discussion on the infrastructure with Mitch Landrieu. They did an extraordinary job answering questions. Of course, the governors are used to fixing roads. Uh, we know how to get it done and bridges and the infrastructure funds, you know, the consensus or in a bipartisan way is we want flexibility. So uh, send us the money, uh, give us flexibility. Uh, we will spend it and you can audit us. Uh, but uh, we, we would welcome uh, uh, that partnership. I also want to thank uh, Secretary Raimondo. Uh, she led a panel discussion on my passion of increasing computer science education in grades K through 12. And uh, we have a plan as governors to do that. We believe it's a national security issue and we're very appreciative of the support of your administration and Secretary Raimondo in that regard. I want to give thanks on a couple of points. Uh, all the governors appreciate the support of the National Guard. The National Guard has been indispensable and critical to the governors they have assisted at our hospitals, our testing sites, distribution of vaccines, and more. So thank you for supporting uh, our utilization.